Chapter 6 The dinosaur lifted its powerful leg. Smash! It kicked the car. Windows shattered and the car tilted on its side. The dinosaur lowered its head and budded the car off the road. Inside, Tim and Lex tumbled about as the car rolled over. Now it was upside down. Tim twisted around to look out the window. They were right by a cliff. The T-Rex towered over the car. It put one leg on the frame and tore at the undercarriage of the car with its jaws, biting at anything it could get a hold of. It ripped the rear axle free, tossed it aside, and bit a tire. Lex and Tim were trapped, and the dinosaur was about to push them off the cliff. Alan couldn't stand it anymore. He had to do something. Jumping out of the car, he shouted, Hey, over here! The dinosaur dropped the car and turned towards him. Alan waited to get his complete attention. Then he threw a flare over the cliff. The Tyrannosaurus lunged after it, but stopped inches from the edge. Ian Malcolm watched from the car. Then, in a flash, he leaped out of the car too. Quickly, he ran for the building, but he caught the dinosaur's eye and the T-Rex whirled around. As it did, its tail snapped behind him, striking Alan. Alan went flying, but the dinosaur only nosed Ian. It gave chase, bending close to the ground. Then, when one flick of its head, it nudged Ian from behind. The dinosaur didn't use much of its strength. Still, Ian sailed through the air and smashed through a wooden portion of the wall and into the building. Inside, Gennaro was cowering in a corner. Suddenly, the Tyrannosaurus' head broke through the wall. Wood chips and cement pieces flew everywhere. Crash! The roof collapsed. Ian and Gennaro were buried in the rubble. Slowly, Alan got to his feet. He watched the T-Rex nose around the falling building. Then he saw it stop. It had found something. Alan couldn't bear to watch. He turned away as Gennaro screamed. There was nothing Alan could do to save him. And probably, he thought, Ian is a goner too. But he could try to help the kids. He scrambled over the smashed up car. Reaching in through a broken window, he pulled out Lex. Tim's knocked out, she told him. Boom! A giant T-Rex foot landed right in front of them. Alan and Lex stood still as statues. There was nowhere to go. They were caught between the dinosaur and the cliff. The dinosaur bent inches away from them. Then, once again, it pushed the car. Tim opened his eyes. He saw one giant eye staring at him through the open hole in the sunroof. He screamed, and that seemed to fascinate the dinosaur. It stretched its long tongue through the hole. It was trying to wrap its tongue around Tim. Quickly, Tim wedged himself tightly into the seat. He was just out of the dinosaur's reach. Roaring in defeat, the T-Rex lunged again. The car shifted, then began to roll. It was heading towards the cliff, gathering speed, and Lex and Alan were right in front of it. Alan grabbed Lex and swung her onto his back. Then he began to climb down the cliff. Seconds later, the car went by. Whiz! Alan pressed up against the cliffside. It just missed them. Timmy! cried Lex as the car dropped through the air. Crash! It landed in a rooftop and hung there in the branches. The Tyrannosaurus gave one last roar, but everyone was beyond its reach. It turned away, leaving them alone. For now. Chapter 7 Dennis Nedry jumped into a jeep. He had to hurry if he was going to make the boat. Clutching the shaving cream can full of dinosaur specimens, he drove through the park gates. A moment later, he came to another gate. This one said, Danger! Electrified fence! This door cannot be opened when fence is armed. But Nedry knew the fence was turned off. He reached over and pushed it open. Then he roared off towards the docks, driving deeper into the park. The rain beat against the jeep. It was coming down so hard, Nedry could barely see. He stepped on the gas. Time was running out. He had to get to the ship. Ten minutes passed. I should have been there by now, Nedry muttered to himself. He checked his watch. When he looked up, he slammed on the brakes. There was a cement wall right in front of him. The jeep skidded off the road, landing in a muddy ditch. Nedry put it in reverse. The tire spun, but the car didn't move. It was stuck. Nedry signed as he got out of the car. He'd have to push. Hoot, hoot. A soft noise came from the woods. Was it an owl? Nedry shined his flashlight into the trees. There was nothing there. Hoot, hoot. Nedry froze. This time he saw something, and it wasn't an owl. 
It was a dinosaur. Nedry peered at it through the rain. He didn't think it looked dangerous, only four feet tall. It was spotted and had a bright crest on its head. And it was hopping around like a kangaroo. Nedry almost laughed. He didn't know it was a Dilophosaurus, the dinosaur with the poisonous spit. Nice boy, said Nedry. Now run along, I have to move the jeep. The dinosaur didn't listen. It circled Nedry playfully. Hoot hoot, it called. It was acting like it wanted to play, but it was getting in Nedry's way. Go on, said Nedry. Go home, dinner time. Aren't you hungry? The dinosaur just stared at him. Nedry spied a stick on the ground. Picking it up, he shouted, Fetch! Then he tossed it behind a tree. The Dilophosaurus leaped behind the tree, but a second later it was back. Hoo! it called, jumping right in front of Nedry. Nedry was so startled, he fell backward. He didn't feel like laughing now. He was angry. I said, beat it! Nedry picked up a rock and threw it at the dinosaur. The Dilophosaurus hooted softly. It sounded sad, almost as if its feelings were hurt. Then it hopped away. Finally, Nedry set to work on the jeep. He almost had it out of the ditch when he heard the hooting again. The Dilophosaurus was standing a few feet away. Suddenly, it reared back its head, then snapped it forward. Splat! A big glob of spit smacked Nedry in the chest. Splat! Another glob hit him in the face. Ah! screamed Nedry. The first shot had just felt strange, but the spit that hit his face seeped into his eyes. Nedry felt an incredible shooting pain. A second passed, and Nedry realized he couldn't see. He was blind. Feeling his way around, he stumbled into the jeep. He sat, clutching its eyes in pain. Then he heard a hissing noise. The dinosaur was in the car too. Nedry shrieked in horror, but no one could help him now. Chapter 8 On the other side of the park, Alan and Lex had managed to scramble down the cliff. It had stopped raining, and now they were looking up at the trees. The car was still stuck in the branches, but it didn't look very secure. A branch broke. The car fell a few feet. Then it stopped, held up by more branches. Lex was shaking. She could barely breathe. Her brother was up there. Please let Timmy be okay. Please let Timmy be okay. Please let Timmy be okay, she kept saying to herself. I have to go help your brother, Alan said to her. Lex shook even more. She didn't want to be left alone. Gennaro had left him alone, and look what happened. Alan wanted to comfort her, but he didn't know how. Feeling clumsy, he patted her on the head. Lex threw her arms around his waist and wouldn't let go. Alan looked around. A large drain pipe ran along the ground. He led Lex over to it. Shh, shh. I'll take care of you, he told her. I'm not going to leave. Just stay here for a few minutes while I help Tim. You'll be okay. Alan coaxed Lex a bit more, and finally she crawled into the pipe. Alan made sure Lex was safely inside, then he walked back to the tree. He took a deep breath and began to climb. Up, up, up. The tree seemed unbelievably tall, but at last he reached the car. Carefully, Alan opened the driver's door. Tim was huddled on the other side, hugging his knees. His face was streaked with blood and tears. He looked so frightened. Alan's heart went out to him. I, I, I threw up, said Tim, ashamed. That's okay. Just give me your hand. Tim didn't move. Come on, Tim. I won't tell anyone you threw up. Now give me your hand. Tim reached out. But just as Alan got a hold of him, the car lurched and Tim tumbled out the door. He fell against Alan, and they both dropped down a few branches. Now they are right below the car. Suddenly they heard a groan. The branch that held the car was giving away. Let's go, said Alan. Together, they half climbed, half fell down a tree. Snap, snap, snap. More branches broke. The car was falling. It was heading right for them. They jumped. Alan and Tim hit the ground, hard. But the car was almost on top of them. So Alan grabbed Tim and rolled to the side. A second later, the car landed, right where they had been. The car stood upright, its roof inches from Alan and Tim. Suddenly, it tipped over. Tim squeezed his eyes shut. After all that, the car was still going to fall on them. Thud! Tim felt a rush of air. But that was all. How strange, he thought, opening his eyes. Then he realized he was inside the car. They were saved by the hole in the sunroof. Alan brought Tim over to the drain pipe where Lex was hiding. Then he peered inside. 
Lex was curled into a ball, shaking with fright. She was too terrified to crawl back out. Come on, Lex, Alan said in a soothing voice. Hiding isn't the answer. We have to get moving and improve our situation. Lex just stared at him, not budging an inch. Tim rolled his eyes. Lex could be so ridiculous. Alan tried again. Tim's out here. He's okay. Still, there was no response. Then Alan tried something else. Of course, you could just wait in there while we go back and get help. Yes, said Tim quickly. Let's go. You'll probably be safe alone, Alan went on, but I couldn't say for sure. You're a liar, shouted Lex. You said you wouldn't leave me. I'm using psychology on you, said Alan. Lex just kept staring at him. Didn't he know things like psychology never work? Alan took a deep breath. Okay, we're going to walk back, together, but we won't go near the road. The T-Rex probably staked that out as a feeding range. That means this whole padlock is empty. It's safe, so we'll walk through here. What do you say? In answer, Lex crawled out of the pipe. Alan sounded so sure of himself, he made everything seem okay. But then, as they began to walk, Alan made a mistake. He kept talking. It might be a little slow going, but it can't be more than three or four miles to the visitor center. Maybe the T-Rex is done feeding. No, no. Let's not kid ourselves. A carnivore can eat 25% of its weight in just one sitting. So really, it's probably just up to the main course and... Alan stopped in mid-sentence. Both kids were in the drain pipe now. Back in the control room, Mr. Hammond, Ray Arnold, Robert Muldoon, and Ellie, who had gotten a ride back from Dr. Harding, had realized that Nedry was gone for good. Without him, they couldn't turn the power back on. So there was nothing else to do. They had to go into the jungle and search for the others. Now Ellie and Muldoon were driving down the dark park road. Hurry, 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 Ellie said to Muldoon. She had a feeling that something terrible had happened. At last, they came to the broken Tyrannosaurus fence. Oh no, cried Ellie. Things looked worse than she imagined. One electric car was gone. The other was empty, its doors hanging open. Muldoon ran over to the wrecked building. Then he saw Gennaro's body and stopped short. Roar! They could hear the Tyrannosaurus in the distance. Ellie joined Muldoon, frightened. The T-Rex could be anywhere, Muldoon said to her. Suddenly, they heard another sound, but this one was human. It sounded like a moan. It's Malcolm, Muldoon cried. He and Malcolm was half buried under the rubble. He was alive, but he was in bad shape. He was barely conscious, and one leg was covered with blood. Roar! The Tyrannosaurus was closer now. Can we risk moving him? Ellie asked. Please, risk it, Malcolm croaked. Carefully, they carried him to the back seat of the Jeep, and Ellie went back to the empty car. She wouldn't give up. Desperately, she looked for clues. What could have happened? Look, she said. There were three sets of footprints. Alan and the kids were alive. Roar! The Tyrannosaurus was getting closer. The earth shook with each thundering step. The booming noise grew louder and faster. Still, Ellie couldn't leave the spot. Maybe Alan was nearby. She had to find him. Suddenly, the Tyrannosaurus burst onto the road, charging right at her. Come on, shouted Ian with all of his might. Ellie leaped into the Jeep. Muldoon was already behind the wheel. He hit the gas, and they were off. But the jeep was slow to pick up speed, and the Tyrannosaurus was coming after them, fast. Ellie looked back. It was closing the gap. The jeep smashed through branches and careened over rocks. Again, Muldoon floored the gas. Finally, the jeep picked up speed. The T-Rex fell behind, then faded from sight. For a few minutes, they drove in silence. Then Ian gave a little laugh. Think they'll have that on the tour, he asked. Chapter 9 Alan had finally convinced Lex and Tim to come out of the drain pipe, and now, slowly but surely, they were making their way through Jurassic Park. A full moon lit the jungle, so they were able to see. The strange light made everything look spooky, but they didn't have a choice. They had to keep going. They had to get to the visitor center. So Alan, Lex, and Tim hiked and climbed through the night, always on the lookout for dinosaurs. There was no power anywhere in the park. That meant the dinosaurs were still on the loose. The T-Rex could be anywhere. Alan checked a map he had taken from the visitor center. Was that only this morning? It seemed like they had been walking for a million years. 
Looks like we're heading west, he said. That's good, I think. We should definitely hit the visitor center this way. Lex took his hand. They walked side by side for a moment. Then Alan turned to Tim. You want to hold my other hand, he asked. Tim just shook his head. He was determined to make it on his own. He'll never hold anybody's hand, said Lex. Timmy is a dinosaur, a jerkosaurus. Straight A brainiac, Tim shot back. Dorkatops. Roar! The sound silenced everyone. You both look pretty tired. I think we should find some place to rest, Alan said. Roar! Once again, Alan climbed a tree, but this time, Tim and Lex were right behind him. When they reached the top, they were awestruck by the view. The park stretched for miles around. The trees, the meadows, the herd of dinosaurs. It was all a beautiful sight. Lex thought it was romantic, too. Are you and Dr. Sattler married? Lex asked, settling the branches. Well, uh, we're, uh... Those are brachiosaurs, Tim said, trying to change the subject. He pointed out the dozens of plant-eating dinosaurs. Their long, graceful necks towered above the trees. Yes, they are brachiosaurs, Alan told him. It's a great name. It means arm lizard. Lex leaned forward. Don't listen to him, she said to Alan. Timmy always talks about dinosaurs when he thinks something is mushy. That's okay, said Alan. So do I. Tim thought they should go back to talking about dinosaurs. He had a question. How could dinosaurs turn into birds? Birds don't have teeth, and some dinosaurs do. Simple evolution, explained Alan. As birds evolved, they lost their teeth. They began to use gizzard stones instead, like the Triceratops. Yeah, but Tim was excited. He thought he could outsmart Alan. But shouldn't there be a missing link? After the dinosaurs disappeared, shouldn't there have been birds with teeth? There were, Alan answered. Toothed seagulls. They were found in Kansas in the 1800s. Tim thought about that for a second. Satisfied, he stopped his questioning and the three fell silent. They could hear the animals calling each other. Some calls sounded just like music. Alan smiled at the pretty sounds, but after a moment, his smile faded. Were those mating calls, he wondered? And how could that be? All the dinosaurs were supposed to be female. His thoughts were interrupted by Lex. What if the dinosaurs come while we're sleeping? I'll stay awake, Alan promised. Lex came closer and crawled under his arm. Tim hesitated for a minute, then curled under Alan's other arm. Tim and Lex leaned back against the tree trunk. Minutes later, they were fast asleep. Alan looked down at the sleeping kids. Who would have thought that he'd be sitting here with two children under his arms? He sighed to himself. Maybe kids weren't so terrible after all. He just hoped he wouldn't let them down. The next morning, Alan and the kids woke with a start. A brachiosaurus was munching on leaves, right by their heads. Lex opened her mouth to scream, but nothing came out. It's okay, said Tim. It's a brachiosaurus, Lex. A veggiesaurus. He climbed up to a higher branch so he could pat the dinosaur's head. Alan, meanwhile, was inspecting its mouth. The dinosaur didn't seem to mind. It just continued munching. Feeling a little braver, Lex edged closer. She was just in front of the dinosaur's head. She reached out, gently patting its nose. Achoo! The dinosaur sneezed, but it was more like an explosion. Ew, said Lex in disgust. She was dripping wet from head to toe. Lex dropped to the ground and stomped away. Oh great, Tim said to Alan as they climbed down too. Now she'll never try anything again. She'll just sit in her room for computer for the rest of her life. Alan jumped the last few feet. Then he saw something that made him stop in his tracks. Oh my, he said in surprise. He crouched down and picked it up. Tim landed next to him and Lex came over too. What is it? asked Tim. Alan was holding a thin piece of white shell. It's a dinosaur egg, Alan said. Part of him couldn't believe it, but the other part wasn't surprised at all. The dinosaurs are breeding. Right in front of him was a whole group of eggs that were already hatched. But my grandpa said that all the dinosaurs are girls, exclaimed Tim. He also said scientists changed the dinosaur's genetic code. They blend it with frog DNA, Alan explained and some West African frogs can change sex when there is only males or females around. That way they're able to breed. Alan shook his head. Ian was right. Life found a way. Chapter 10 The sun was just coming up, 
and Ian, Ellie, and Muldoon were safely back at the control room. Ray Arnold was hunched over his computer, where he'd been all night. No matter what he tried, he couldn't fix the security system. Dennis Nedry's commands were too complicated. I can't get Jurassic Park back online, he finally admitted to Mr. Hammond. We'll have to shut down the entire system, Mr. Hammond said. That will wipe out everything Nedry did. Then we can turn everything back on. The systems will be back to normal. The fences, the phones, everything will be working. And then we can locate Alan and my grandkids. Ellie, Muldoon, and Ian all listened closely. Shutting down the system would turn everything off. No lights, no computers. And what if the system didn't come back on? Then they'd really be sunk. There'd be no chance for survival at all. Ray Arnold hated to do it, but he also knew he had no choice. He walked over to a metal red box on the wall. He took a key from his belt and unlocked the panel. Inside were a row of switches. One by one, Ray Arnold flipped them off. You asked for it, he said, and he pulled the final switch. Every computer and every light shut off. They were in near darkness. Seconds ticked by. Then Arnold flipped the switches back on. Nothing happened. For a moment, Arnold was too panicked to move. Then he raced over to the main computer. It's okay, he shouted. The screen was glowing. A minute later, two words appeared. System ready. But the lights are still out, said Ian, confused. The shutdown turned off the circuit breakers, Arnold explained. We just have to turn them back on. Then all the systems will come back on. The circuit box is in the maintenance shed. That's on the other side of the main compound. I'll go. In three minutes, the entire park will be under control. Arnold hurried out of the control room. Ellie and the others followed, carrying Ian on the stretcher. They were going to an underground shelter across from the visitor center. Muldoon, Mr. Hammond ordered, round up any staff members who are still on the island and bring them over too. Mr. Hammond thought everyone would be safer in the shelter, but even he knew it wasn't dinosaur proof. All morning long, Alan, Tim, and Lex trampled through the jungle. At last, Alan let them rest in a meadow. The visitor center should be just a mile from here if we... Alan stopped talking. A strange animal cry echoed through the jungle. Then the ground began to shake. Alan, squinting into the distance, could only make out shapes. But the shapes were coming closer. And seconds later, Alan realized what was happening. Dozens of dinosaurs were running. It was a stampede! They're just like a flock of birds, said Alan, running away from an enemy. Then they heard another cry. Roar! It was a Tyrannosaurus. But where was it? The sound seemed to come from everywhere at once. Suddenly, the dinosaur herd changed direction. Now it's heading straight for Alan, Tim, and Lex. Quickly, they ran for cover of the jungle, but the dinosaurs moved more quickly. Alan knew they'd never make it. He pulled the kids under a mass of giant tree roots. They hid just in time. A second later, the herd thundered above their heads. They could see clawed feet through the roots. The dinosaurs were running for the jungle. Roar! The T-Rex burst out from behind the trees. It had been in the jungle all along. And now it stood in front of the herd. The dinosaurs scattered, but the Tyrannosaur was already on top of them. With a mighty roar, it sunk its teeth into the closest dinosaur. Tim and Alan watched, fascinated, but Lex knew this was the time to leave while the T-Rex was busy. Come on, you guys, she said. They ran toward the visitor center. The underground shelter was hot and crowded, and like the rest of the park, it was unfinished. Ellie paced back and forth as best she could among the crates and the ladders. She was waiting with Mr. Hammond, Ian, Muldoon, and the other Jurassic Park employees for Ray Arnold to return. Something went wrong, she said after a while. I'm going to get the power back on. I'll ride shotgun, offered Muldoon. Everyone sprang into action. Muldoon hurried over to a steel cabinet. Inside were shotguns, rockets, and other weapons. Muldoon took the biggest gun he could find and quickly loaded it with bullets. In another corner of the shelter, Mr. Hammond unearthed a set of blueprints. He pulled out a map of the maintenance shed. Then with Ian at his side, he poured over it inch by inch, trying to find the circuit box. Meanwhile, Ellie grabbed a flashlight from the open crate. Right next to it was a walkie-talkie set. She tossed one over to Mr. Hammond. Think you can read that map and talk us through the shed? She asked. Absolutely, he said. Seconds later, they were ready. Chapter 11 Alan, Lex, and Tim trudged down the last hill before the visitor center. They were exhausted, and there, right in front of them, was an incredibly high fence. It was a fence that protected the main compound. 
They were so close but so tired. Lex and Tim collapsed on the ground. Power's still out, Alan said, poking the fence with a stick. It's a big climb, though. Think you can make it? Nope, said Tim. Way too high, said Lex. The Tyrannosaurus roared in the distance. Tim and Lex leaped to their feet, ready to climb. To get to the maintenance shed, Ellie and Muldoon had to cross the compound. That meant skirting the jungle and walking past the raptor pen. They stepped onto the path. Keep moving, Muldoon whispered as they approached the pen. Ellie kept walking, but as she drew close to the raptor pen, her heart beat faster. She looked at the fence that surrounded it. Oh, God, she said. There was a hole in the fence, a hole large enough for an animal to slip through, and Ellie knew what that meant. The raptors were out. Then Ellie saw the shed. We can make it if we run, she said. No, we can't. We're being hunted. Muldoon nodded towards the jungle. Ellie saw the shadow of an animal creeping through the palm trees. It was a raptor. Run to the shed, Muldoon ordered, raising his rifle. I'll take care of it. Ellie hopped over branches. She sprinted across open spaces. She didn't look back. At last she was there. She threw open the door and slammed it shut behind her. I'm in, Ellie said, speaking into the walkie-talkie. Okay, Mr. Hammond answered. He and Ian began to direct her, down a metal staircase and through a passageway, until she reached a big metal box. Ellie found it. Then, listening to Mr. Hammond, she opened the door. Inside was a handle. Ellie pumped it. Next, she pressed a series of buttons. The buttons turned on the park systems, Mr. Hammond was saying. Activate them all. The last one was marked Compound Fence. Alan climbed the fence faster than the kids. He was already on the ground when he saw the warning light flash on the fence post. The power is about to go on, and Lex and Tim were at the top. Get off the fence, Alan shouted. Now! Quickly, Lex scrambled down, but Tim froze with fear. He was too terrified to climb. The light flashed quicker and quicker. Let go, Tim, Alan cried. Suddenly, there was a loud buzz. The fence hummed as a current ran through it. It was electrified. Tim shook violently. Then he was thrown to the ground. Alan and Lex raced over. And Tim's face was white. His hands were burned a bright red. But worst of all, he wasn't breathing. Oh no, he's dead, he's dead, Lex cried out. Alan ripped Tim's shirt open. He pressed down on his chest, performing CPR. Come on, Timmy, he said. Again and again he pressed. Then he breathed into Tim's mouth. Ah, Tim gasped as he came to. Timmy, Lex shouted happily. He was still in a daze, but he was going to be all right. Alan carefully wrapped Tim's hands with pieces of his shirt. Then he and Lex helped Tim over to the visitor center. Lights flickered on in the maintenance shed, and Ellie blinked in the sudden brightness. Then she saw the raptor. It was behind the circuit box. For a second, it just looked at her. Then it slashed out. Ellie stepped back just in time, but now something was brushing her shoulder. It was an arm. Ray Arnold's arm. He was dead, stuck behind a tangle of pipes. Ellie didn't stay for a closer look. The raptor is about to spring. She took off, running down the passageway, but the raptor was close behind. She could hear its sharp claws clicking against the floor. It drew closer and closer. When Ellie reached the door, she was just one step ahead of the raptor. Flinging the door open, she spun around and slammed it shut. Ellie took a deep breath. She was outside. Better yet? The raptor was inside, trapped. Muldoon stole quietly through the jungle. He could barely see the gray-colored raptor through the leaves. But the raptor was moving closer into the jungle, and so was Muldoon. Suddenly, the raptor stopped. It rose to its full height. Gotcha, said Muldoon, about to pull to pull the trigger. Then he paused. The raptor was the perfect target. Too perfect. Was this a setup? Those were Muldoon's last thoughts. Another raptor pounced from behind. Chapter 12 The visitor center was deserted. Chairs were turned over. Signs were on the floor. Branches poked through the windows. It looked like the jungle had taken over. Alan led Lex and Tim into the restaurant. I need to find the others, he said, and Tim needs a doctor. Will you take care of him for me, Lex? She nodded, her eyes wide. She was terrified. Tim's hair was wild from the shock of electricity. Alan looked at him a moment, then he smoothed it down. Big Tim, the human piece of toast, he said softly. Tim gave a weak laugh. Quickly, before he could change his mind, 
Alan kissed Tim and Lex on the foreheads. Then he headed across the restaurant. Be right back, he said, walking out the door. For a moment, Lex was at a loss. What should they do next? Are you hungry, Timmy? She went to the food counter and started loading things onto a tray. Suddenly she froze. Something's here, she whispered. Through the restaurant window, she could see into the lobby. There was a life-size picture of a raptor, and right next to it was a real one. Can you run, Tim? she asked. I don't think so, he answered faintly. Lex pulled Tim to his feet. Throwing his arm over her shoulder, she helped him to the kitchen. As quietly as she could, she shut the shiny metal door. There was no lock. Then she led Tim down an aisle to the back of the room. They huddled behind a counter, trying to hide. All at once, they saw the raptor's head. It was peering at them through the round window of the kitchen door. Bang! The raptor thumped against the metal. The door didn't budge. The raptor stared at the door handle. It was figuring out how it worked. Slowly, it reached out its clawed hand. Inside the kitchen, Lex and Tim stared. The handle was turning. The door opened. The raptor stood framed in the doorway, drawing itself up to its full height. It snarled. Then it moved into the room. But it wasn't alone. Right behind it was another raptor. They both paused, sniffing the air. The first raptor went down one aisle. The other raptor chose a different one. Tim and Lex crawled down the third aisle, the center one, in the opposite direction. They were heading for the door, but first they had to get past the raptors, and ordinary kitchen counters were the only things between Lex and Tim and the dinosaurs. Tim and Lex moved towards the door. Just as they passed the raptors, one of the dinosaurs turned and knocked pots and pants off the counter, right on the kids' heads. Somehow, Tim and Lex managed to keep quiet. Lex kept crawling, but Tim was falling behind, and Lex didn't realize it. Exhausted, Tim brushed up against some pots and they clattered to the ground. Hearing the noise, the raptors stopped. Then they turned and headed for Tim. Click, click. Suddenly, there was another noise. It was coming from the other end of the aisle. The raptors turned again. It was Lex, wrapping a spoon on the floor. They began to move towards her. Quickly, Lex slid into a steel cabinet. She tried to pull down the shiny sliding door, but it was stuck, and the raptors were coming closer. Tim, meanwhile, spotted a walk-in freezer. If he could just get inside. Using all his strength, he pulled himself up. Then he limped towards the freezer. But one raptor saw Tim moving and headed his way. Now one raptor was closing in on Lex, and the other on Timmy. The raptors pounced at the same time, but instead of striking Lex, the raptor went for a reflection on the shiny cabinet door. Thud. It hit the cabinet hard and fell to the ground. Tim made it to the freezer. He ripped the door open and stumbled inside. The floor was icy. So icy, Tim went sliding across the floor. The raptor was right behind him and skidded too, right past Tim. There was a moment of confusion in the freezer and Tim saw his chance to escape. He hurried out the door, the raptor at his heels. Lex flung the door closed just in time. The raptor was trapped inside. Lex looked at the other raptor. It was getting to its feet. She threw her arm around Tim and together they raced into the hallway. Suddenly, dark shapes loomed in front of them, but they couldn't stop running. Crash! They careened into the figures and fell to the ground. A second later, they were yanked to their feet. It was Alan and Ellie. Let's go, said Alan. Chapter 13 Alan, Ellie, Lex, and Tim raced to the control room. Alan made sure Tim was okay. Then he ran back to lock the door. Hey, the door doesn't lock, Alan said. The computer has to give the signal. Ellie was studying the flashing computer screen. We have to turn on the program, she explained. Bang! A snarling raptor hit the door. Alan pushed back, trying to keep it out. Bang! The raptor tried again. The door gave away, a little. Alan could hold it by himself. Ellie ran over to help, but even two people couldn't keep it shut for long. Lex slid into the command chair at the computer. Her fingers flew over the keyboard. Where was that door lock command? At last she found it. There was a beep, a buzz, and a lock clicked shut. The raptor was locked outside. Ellie joined Lex at the main computer. They put their heads together. Min Slayer, they had all the park systems running. At last, Jurassic Park was under control. Meanwhile, Alan foamed the underground shelter. The kids are fine, he told Mr. Hammond and we've got everything back on. 
you can call the mainland for help. Suddenly there was a scream and Alan dropped the phone. The raptor was at the window. Quick, said Alan. The ceiling. He ushered everyone up a ladder and Ellie moved aside a ceiling panel. Then she, Lex, and Tim pulled themselves up into the crawl space. Alan was about to follow when the raptor hurled itself into the room, shattering the glass into little pieces. Without a moment to lose, Alan swung up through the open panel. He caught up to the others, then ran across the ceiling, panel by panel, with Alan helping Tim along. But the raptor saw the ceiling move beneath them. It leaped up high, smashing through the panel in front of Ellie. For a second, the raptor hung suspended in air, snapping and snarling. Then it fell to the floor. Alan motioned everyone to keep moving. Seconds later, the raptor broke through the ceiling again. This time it struck the panel Lex was standing on. Ah! she screamed. Lex was lifted up, right on the raptor's head. Alan kicked at its neck. It snapped back and dropped to the ground. Lex was falling too. Just in time, Alan caught her by the shirt. She dangled for a second, then Alan pulled her up into the ceiling again. Into the air duct, Alan shouted. Metal boomed all around as they raced through the duct. They were safe for the moment, but they had to get down to escape. Finally, they came to a metal grating above the visitor center lobby. Looking down, she could see the dinosaur skeletons and the scaffolding. Let's go through here, said Alan, lifting out the grating. Everyone dropped onto the scaffolding. It was too high to jump to the ground. There was only one thing to do. Alan stepped onto the Brachiosaurus skeleton. Would it hold its weight? Yes, and it seemed strong enough to hold more. The anchor bolts in the ceiling were keeping the skeleton firmly in place. Come on, Alan said to the others. It's okay. Bone by bone, Ellie and the kids started to climb down the skeleton. All at once, there was a groaning sound. The bolts were slowly pulling free of the ceiling. Ellie looked up. We're going to make it, she said. We're going to... Just then came the sounds of claws running on the metal, and a raptor flew out of the air duct. It landed with a loud thump on the scaffolding above their heads. The Brachiosaurus swayed with the impact. Go! Go! shouted Alan. Everyone picked up speed, scampering down the skeleton at breakneck pace. Making its move, the raptor sprang onto the Brachiosaurus' neck, but the extra weight was too much. The anchor bolts ripped free and the skeleton collapsed like a flimsy house of cards. Alan, Ellie, and the kids tumbled to the ground with the raptor right behind. They landed on a pile of bones, the raptor a few feet away. Everyone was okay, but now the raptor was trying to stand. It got up shakily, staggered for a moment, and fell back to the ground. Alan and Ellie gathered the kids close, helping them to their feet. The main entrance was just a few yards away, if they could get outside. They were almost there when they saw the other raptor. It was in the doorway, blocking their escape. Behind them, the first raptor pulled itself up. Hissing, the raptors crouched for their attack. There was nowhere to hide and nothing to do. All of a sudden, a tremendous tearing noise echoed through the lobby. A dark, giant shadow fell across the room. The Tyrannosaurus had broken through the lobby wall. Compared to the mighty T-Rex, the raptors looked like toys. Vicious, hungry toys. The T-Rex lowered its great head, reaching down and down, then it clamped its jaw around the nearest raptor. The helpless dinosaur howled in pain as the T-Rex lifted high into the air. For a moment, the Tyrannosaurus tossed its head back and forth, swinging the raptor in its mouth. Finally, it dropped the raptor to the ground. Ow! howled the raptor with its final breath. Then the lobby was silent, and Alan was able to hear the screech of tires. Mr. Hammond and Ian Malcolm had just pulled up in a jeep. But the second raptor was going to action. Leaping 12 feet into the air, it lunged at the T-Rex. The raptor clawed at the T-Rex's side, slashing out with its deadly sharp claws. The Tyrannosaurus bellowed and began to fight back. Alan didn't waste a minute. He herded everyone outside and into the waiting jeep. Just as the T-Rex felled the raptor with one mighty blow. But before the jeep could pull away, the T-Rex whirled around to face it. Luckily, its powerful tail struck the other skeleton, the Tyrannosaurus Rex, and it stopped in confusion. The skeleton crumpled, and Alan saw the Tyrannosaur bones fall harmlessly around the living, breathing dinosaur. Nothing can compare to the real thing, Alan thought. Nothing. And they sped away. When they were a safe distance from the T-Rex, Alan closed his eyes. He felt relief, exhaustion, everything at once. Then he looked around at Ellie, Lex, and Tim, and had to grin. By the way, Mr. Hammond, he said, 
I've given this careful consideration, and I've decided not to endorse Jurassic Park. Mr. Hammond smiled and said, after careful consideration, so have I. A little later, everyone was on board a helicopter heading for home. Rescue teams had been sent from the mainland, along with doctors who had examined each person. Ian Malcolm was going to be fine, so was Tim. Everyone was safe and sound. They were thankful, but also felt a little sad. Jurassic Park would never open. The animals would have to be destroyed. Dinosaurs would never roam the earth again. In the back of the helicopter, Alan sat with Lex and Tim. Ellie smiled at him. She never thought he'd be so comfortable with kids. He'd changed the past couple of days. But then she thought they all had. They had made out alive. They were survivors. Ellie moved over to sit next to Alan. She grabbed his hand and held it tight. Lex looked over. Quickly, she reached for his other hand. She still thought he was cute. Alan smiled at both of them. Then he gazed out the window. He saw a flock of birds fly by in perfect formation. They looked like a herd of dinosaurs running across the field. Alan nudged Tim. Tim looked out the window too, then grinned. He understood. In some way, dinosaurs would always live on. And that's our story, Jurassic Park, the junior novelization. What can be said about this except, what kind of idiots would try to open a dinosaur park? I mean, really? You think people would want to go see this? I mean, maybe it was a novel idea for 1993. I mean, it's not like they're going to get that uh, guy from the Lego movie to be in the new one, are they? I mean, I can only imagine how that will go. Legos and dinosaurs. Hmm. wonder if they're going to do anything with that. Ah. Well, this is your host, Marvelous Matt Bish, for Marvel Peace Theater. Please, come back again. And for those of you who didn't like this, well, I got two words for you. But I can't say them. Goodbye.